Good morning, Astronomy 1020. Uh, it's Tuesday, April 20th, and uh, this week we're going to be talking about the end states of stars, what happens when stars run out of nuclear fuel and they either puff out into a planetary nebula or they explode in a dramatic supernova, and then this whole new world of bizarre stellar objects comes into being. White dwarfs, neutron stars, and black holes. These are what we call in astronomy the stellar remnants. They're weird. They're fun to talk about. I'm sure this is going to be a blast. Uh, a couple of notes administrative before we get started. Believe it or not, I've graded all your papers. Astronomy 1020 is completely graded. Um, what you guys really should do, especially before the clock runs out in this semester, you should all go and check your grade book to make sure everything looks correct. Obviously, there's a whole bunch of people who don't turn stuff in all the time, and that's between them and their gods. Um, <clears throat> and those of you I'm worried about who think they've turned in everything, but perhaps there was like a little glitch in Blackboard. Sometimes Blackboard gets a little glitchy. You just want to go and check all that stuff out before the semester ends. So now that I've caught up, give it all a once over, make sure everything looks correct. Um, that sounds like a pretty good idea. Shouldn't take you more than a minute. Uh, we have done 11 labs this far. How many homeworks have we done? Uh, my, my target goal for the class was to do 12 labs and 12 homeworks. So we've done 10 homeworks and we've done 11 labs. With that in mind, I need to, and I want to do homework this week and next week, that'll be 12 homeworks. But since we're at 11 labs, we can choose to not do a 13th. I have a 13th, but I'm thinking uh, building in a little extra time towards the end of the semester will be good for everyone. Uh, plus it's a beautiful, warm, sunny day, and I'm sure people would like to go outside for a little bit. So, um, oh, actually Vladimir is already outside, so he gamed us on that one. <laughs> um, uh, so here's what I'm thinking. I talked to the class before the recording and I think I'm gonna cancel lab today and I'm going to hold the 12th lab on the period luminosity relationship next week. Um, if there are any objections, feel free to voice them now. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't think so. Um, so, uh, so that's the plan and I hope you like it. So that means we will just have a lecture today and then we'll stop and we'll run into the sun. On Thursday, we're gonna do it right. We're gonna have part two of this lecture. We're gonna do a homework on the death of stars. It's gonna be a fun, short homework. Um, next week, we will do a lab and a homework and that will be our final week. And probably most of you will choose to double your midterm grade rather than take the final. Those of you who wish to take the final, there is a final for you to take. And that is your right and your prerogative if you wish to do so. Okay. Uh, yeah, Vladimir. Yeah. So on Blackboard, on my CCRI, not Blackboard, my CCRI account, uh, all professors that I had for this semester, they had like a little flag with, um, with what is this? It's not feedback, but it's... Uh, oh, student ratings of instructions. Yeah, so I didn't see what flag for you. So I was like, is it, do you not need it or no I, I i would like to get ratings for you guys to find out your opinions of the course i think i for some reason need to go and click a flag saying yes i want this uh i don't know why they would they would automatically default it off but i just have forgotten to do that so vladimir that's another thing that i'm going to do with my day today vladimir if you think about it uh because you probably have a better uh intact memory than me please remind me at the end of our lecture today to, to switch that flag on because I could easily forget during the hour and a half lecture, okay? Uh, but that's something I need to do and I want to do. And on that note, everyone, once I flip that switch, feel free to go and evaluate me and tell you how much you love the, or hate the course, whatever you think. Okay, good ideas. Um, so let's grab the old magic marker here and we figure out which one works. And um, you'll remember that last week, we lectured on the lifespan of a one solar mass star. That's a star like the sun who is considered a low mass star. Today, even though we're supposed to be starting the depths of stars, we're gonna kind of review the life cycle of a high mass star and use that to kind of transition. So 
we're just a little teensy bit behind, but it's no big deal. Um, so let's think about, uh, by the way, there was a table that we started making before. I do plan on, uh, in fact, why don't I start by constructing that table again? And you guys can help me either from memory or you can use your notes. <clears throat> this will be a nice review from last week, but it'll also kind of help us efficiently take care of the business that we have to do this week. Wait, we still didn't complete the the table, did we? No, that's what we're about to do now, with your permission. Uh, oh yeah. So we in a short while, because I, I left my old notes in my room. So. Oh okay. Well, if you have a ruler or a straight edge, you could probably make a. Yeah, Vladimir, do whatever you got to do. Okay. So here we have the uh, the the mass type. Um, this is the main sequence stage of a star. Um, yeah, just make a new one, Vladimir. Um, this is the red giant phase. Today, you will see that only high mass stars have an additional phase of fusion. I'm going to label it for now as the blue supergiant phase. But... Uh, but you'll see that it's a little nuanced. Okay, so we'll, we'll have a column for blue. Mm. Sorry, bad planning. Blue super giants. Um, <clears throat> and then finally, the subject of chapter 18 in the book, which probably no one reads, the subject of this week, this is a whole chapter in itself is stellar death, okay? So, um, you know what I'd like to do? Well, okay, some of you are probably completing the table we built before. So Mateus, on that previous chart, I think I put low mass stars at the top, didn't I? Which is a little goofy, but okay. I like to put high mass stars at the top normally, but I, I played some games. We don't need as big a column for intermediate. Okay, so we have low mass stars. Remind me of the, uh, the mass ranges of a low mass star. Zero point one. Oh, never mind. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Vladimir. That's does you got you beat him, so go for it. <laughs> Zero point one to two stellar mass. Okay. I want I want to drive these numbers home for you guys. We have an intermediate class, which goes from two to eight solar mass units. And today we're gonna to focus a bit at the beginning on the high mass stars, which go from, oops, excuse me, which go from eight, not quite to infinity. What do you guys think? What's about the highest mass that a star can have? What's the highest mass a star can have? Amy chimes in with 100 solar mass units. Nice to hear from you, Amy. All right. So let's review what we learned last week. Low mass stars undergo fusion on the main sequence using the proton-proton chain. You guys will remember that in the proton-proton chain, four hydrogens fuse to one helium Sorry about the squishiness. And two gamma rays, okay? So that's four H's transition to one helium and two gamma rays. And I'm gonna rewrite that because it, it looks bad. I can fix it. So four hydrogens turn into one helium and two gamma rays. The gamma rays are of course the energy produced through fusion. 
But what nuclear reaction sequence do we see intermediate and high mass stars using? I think we did talk about that, right? Carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, uh, cycle. reaction. It's not a chain, a cycle. Ah. cycle. That's how we usually say it. So we call it the CNO cycle. And what's the net reaction, the net fusion reaction of the CNO cycle? So it's um, still four hydrogen hydrogens turn into um, one helium. Well, yeah, still into one helium, but with three gamma rays. That's right. And this is what distinguishes intermediate and high mass stars. The fact that they use the CNO cycle for fusion. their reaction is more energetic. It produces more energy. And for this reason, intermediate and high mass stars are more luminous than normal stars. Hey, just as like a quick aside, do you guys remember the four key properties of a star? I think we lectured on that at some point, right? What would you say are the four key properties of a star, the ones that kind of determine all the physics of how it twinkles and all the rest of it? Radius, um, mass, uh, luminosity, um, temperature. So I'm, I'm beeping, I'm beeping today. Um, <clears throat> hey, Vladimir, if you had to take a guess, if one of these properties was more important than any of the others in determining the entire evolution of the star, what would you guess the answer to that question was? I'm going to suggest to you that one of these properties of a star, radius, mass, luminosity, and temperature, one of them matters more than all the rest. One of so them. Temperature doesn't vary a lot. Uh... But I'm not asking about just because it doesn't vary a lot doesn't mean it's not important. But uh, yes, temperature can only vary by about a factor of 10 whereas luminosities vary by a factor of a billion. But I'm not talking about the mm -hmm. range or the domain or whatever you want to call oh. it. I'm talking about the physics I... of the star. One of these controls the rest of the physics of the star. Uh, okay, I'll go with mass. And that would be the correct answer. Do you know why? Um, mm, I, not exactly. Okay, then I'm I mean, going to tell you, I'll tell you why. Or you want okay. to guess? I want to guess. Sure, guess. Like, if if the star is massive enough, uh, like it determines whether it's going to turn into a black hole after it dies, and then it. Well, that's what we're doing here uh, today. Right? Pretty much here, look. Let's just make it simpler, Vladimir. The reason oh, why mass it also the determines the type of fusion it uses. By the way, in a way, but I've got an even bigger picture, simpler way to look at it, which is stars are controlled by gravity. They are big balls of gravity. That's what they are, right? And the mass of a star controls its gravity. The gravity of the star, how hard it squeezes, will determine the type of fusion it does, how long it lives, how luminous it is, how hot it is, even the size, right? These things are controlled by gravity ultimately. And that's why we categorize stars into low, intermediate, and high mass stars. Also notice that all stars have something in common during their main sequence lifespan. They are all fusing hydrogen into helium. And as I mentioned in last week's lecture, so far this is mostly review, stars get the greatest yield of energy per lump of mass using hydrogen to helium fusion, and this sustains the greatest fraction of their life. And you guys may or may not remember this detail. The fact that stars spend more time fusing hydrogen into helium explains why when you look at an actual HR diagram, one that's produced by telescope observers, just by measuring the brightnesses and the temperatures of stars. When you look at a real HR diagram like 
Uh, I'm sorry, I've got the wrong damn slideshow again. This one, here we go. When you look at a real HR diagram, overwhelmingly the greatest number of stars, let's not even, you know what? Graphs with color in them are lame. A real scientist can explain everything with a black and white graph. That's that's how I look at it. Okay, so uh, wait, I'm sorry. I just muted myself here. Control F5. Oh, Jesus. Sorry, guys. I'm having a bad PowerPoint day. Uh, six, what? No. Uh, what am I doing wrong here? Function F. <laughs> uh, you'd think I know how to use this by now. Slide. From current slide. Okay, here we go. Woo. Wow, that was weird. Okay, the fact that stars spend the greatest amount of time fusing hydrogen to helium, this explains why the overwhelming majority of stars that we find lie on the main sequence. This kind of is a steady relationship between mass, temperature, luminosity, and radius, okay? Once stars start running out of hydrogen helium fuel, you'll remember from our lab last week, they begin to evolve up the red giant branch. And then everything gets a little bit weird. <clears throat> That's the business of last week and this week. For instance, do you guys remember what type of fusion low mass stars do when they start to evolve into their red giant phase, which has multiple stages, of course. Um, helium fusion for yeah. low mass stars, and then intermediate and high can fuse a lot more elements. So like after helium, they fuse- Yeah, yeah, but that's my question, Vladimir, is what, what is the name of the nuclear reaction sequence that, that helium fusion undergoes? And what does helium fuse into? If anyone's feeling crazy enough- It fuses take, into carbon. It fuses into carbon. No. Okay. Yep. It fuses into carbon. And what's the reaction called? Uh, H, H chain. No. I know. Triple it's alpha no process. H's. There's no, pardon, Mateus? Is it triple alpha process? Thank you. The triple alpha process. And I'm here to tell you guys that all stars, low, intermediate, and high, all must undergo this same nuclear reaction cycle. In the triple alpha process, three helium fused to one carbon and two gamma rays. Do you guys remember why they call it the triple alpha process? Well, because he, uh, helium, uh, like ionized helium atom is an alpha particle. That's exactly correct. That's what I wanted you to say verbatim. Let me try this again. Function F5. For some reason today, my function key isn't controlling my slideshow. It's, it's muting my computer. And I, I, I got myself in some kind of pickle here. I'm not sure what, I don't understand what's going on. I do this every single day, so I don't, maybe it's control. I am just so confused, guys. It's like the computer, the fact that this little light is on is kind of troubling me. Wait, are you are you on uh, MacBook? No, I'm on this ridiculous Bang and Olfson Elite Book crapola that they gave me from school. Oh, wait, I think I figured it out. Ah, yes. Okay, sorry guys, that took a minute. Um, I don't even remember uh, what the number of the slide was. That was so frustrating. Okay, whatever that issue was, I made it go away, so it shouldn't plague us anymore. Um, <clears throat> eighty-one. Right, the triple alpha process is known as the triple alpha process 
because in particle physics and nuclear physics, an alpha particle is a helium nucleus. And there are three of them ultimately that smash together to make a carbon. The gamma rays that are emitted are the high energy photons that, that power the fuel of the star. <clears throat> I wanna show you guys what's different about a high mass star's evolution from the main sequence versus a low mass star's. You'll remember that low mass stars turn into red giants because, well, actually that's a great test question for you. Why does the radius of a star grow during its red giant phase? If you had to kind of just sum it up into something easy and simple to explain, what is the cause? What is, and I can even, uh, I can give you a, a hint. I can help you look at a picture here. What is the reason why a star's radius grows during its red giant stage. Um, because when um, <clears throat> the hydrogen burning core turns into a helium core, uh, it lets the hydrogen from the outer layers of the sun to kind of leak uh, towards the helium core. And that uh, makes it fuse again, which is called the hydrogen burning shell. And it fuses at a more extreme rate than the hydrogen burning core. Damn, uh, which that's right, Vladimir, full stop. You already won. That was pretty damn good. Um, <laughs> the only way I would make it a little less TLDR, okay, as the kids like to say, is, is you did hit the correct answer and you explained it beautifully. But a simple way to say it is hydrogen shell fusion. It's all about that shell, okay? And, and you did explain the details for those who forgot, but somehow shell fusion fuses at a faster rate or a higher rate, and that causes the radius to expand. Remember that when a, a, a star's radius expands, especially a low mass star, and we have to go over these details because they're confusing, um, the star goes through multiple phases where the, where the star kind of grows up the red giant branch and then it does helium fusion becomes a variable star then it goes back to a double shell burning giant and all that i want to contrast this pathway of a low mass star to what a high mass star like one that would be 25 solar masses does and let's see if we can play baby astronomer right now remember that the astronomers who pieced together this puzzle they didn't start off with someone telling them how a star worked they had to look at the pathways that stars took on an HR diagram and then see if they could understand the mass, luminosity, temperature, radius and try to make sense of the physics. So this is a chance for you guys to play baby astronomer. What do you see the blue stars doing and, and what makes it different than what the, what the low mass stars did? So our sun, when it turns into a red giant will kind of go up and then down and then back like this. What does it mean that we see the highest mass stars, the O's and the B's, these giant blue stars, sliding across into a domain that we call the blue supergiants? It's even debatable whether you could consider a high mass star to, to be a red giant. They're, they're basically called blue supergiants. But I did something kind of tricky with our lecture. Since all stars have to go through the triple alpha process, I pegged that under the high mass stars red giant face, right? And in reality, the high mass stars become blue supergiants. Low mass stars will never be hot enough to fuse carbon. And it turns out weirdly that intermediate mass stars will also not be hot enough to fuse carbon. Only the high mass stars will go through additional nuclear fuel uh, reactions. Intermediate mass stars are kind of lame because they kind of do their main sequence phase like a high mass star and they do their death like a low mass star. So let's fill in the table over here. You guys remember the two objects that are created when a low mass star dies, right? Lived like a champ, died like a loser. <laughs> We're gonna get you on TV, son. No, come on. There are two objects produced during the death of a low mass star. What are they? Uh, stellar nebula and uh, or, or a black hole. No, no, no. Ah, no. So that's so there's a dwarf and the nebula surrounding it. Right. The outer part what? of the star 
Um, it's not a stellar nebula, it's called a planetary nebula. Although, in a way, Vladimir, it should have been called a stellar nebula. They just screwed up, okay? And the internal component, that little nugget of carbon, is called a white dwarf. That was the core of the star. So let me just show you a cartoon picture from this week's slideshow. I actually will make use of this week's slideshow. Uh, this is all quite hard to remember, so that's why we're kind of taking it slow and steady here, trying to keep it interesting. Slide six. <clears throat> so the star becomes a red giant, and as it just keeps expanding itself to death, what was once the carbon degenerate nugget, the core of the star, that becomes left over as a kind of weird bizarro star called a white dwarf. We need to lecture about those today. The outer parts of the star, we call it the outer envelope, that becomes the planetary nebula, and they continue to expand into space. So this stage is common both for low and intermediate mass stars. A planetary nebula and a white dwarf. I know probably a lot of you aren't planning on taking the exam, but I'm really proud of myself for this construction of a table. This synthesizes all of the information from chapters 17 and 18 together. And you could really just have this handy and answer a ton of exam questions on my final exam. So this was meant to be helpful to you. Since we don't have the pressure of the exam, we have the fun and the joy of learning about some weird ass shit we call stars, okay? Remember that stars are beautiful. When you look up at those twinkling lights, you can sit there, you know, worshiping your astrology sign, or you could think about giant fiery balls of plasma undergoing nuclear fusion. It's up to you. You know, I, I prefer this picture myself. Okay, <clears throat> so what happens, back to my question there, what's happening to the physics of my high mass star when it evolves into what we call a blue supergiant? Um, unlike the low mass stars, Low mass stars had to actually become a subgiant and they had to crush down their helium before they could raise it up to that 1 million Kelvin temperature for fusion. The high mass stars are just so hot in the insides that helium fusion turns on instantly. But take a look once again at slide 93 with me. These stars are doing something different. Okay, so let's just analyze from the graph here. What's happening to the temperature of the star? during its blue supergiant phase? Um, it decreases kind of a lot. It actually shifts back and forth too. Yeah, depending on which cycle of fusion it's going through. Um, I think that's when it goes from helium and then carbon fusion, and I'll show you some of the others. As it starts fusing things back and forth, it does a few switchbacks. You'll remember that when helium fusion turned on for the sun, the star returned to hydrostatic equilibrium and began to drop back down towards the main sequence. You said it's kind of pulsating. Uh, yeah, any star, the, the variable stars operate in this zone. It's called the instability strip. So these stars are not in the instability strip. They will, they will not go through those pulsations. Pulsations are unique to kind of stars in, in, in this kind of a zone, something like that. Uh, okay, the temperature is dropping. What's happening happening to the luminosity? It doesn't, it, it barely changes. Yeah, it just stays bright as hell. Uh, by the way, can I give you an example of, of a, a, a blue supergiant? Just so that you kind of know what we're talking about when we look in the sky. Let's just think of our old pal Orion there, which has a nice uh, mixture of stars. I would say the, the, the foot of, of Orion, uh, Rigel, another legendary star is, is a classic example of a blue supergiant. And one of the reasons, one of the tells is while blue stars are usually more luminous than red stars, unless they're red giants like Betelgeuse, the fact that Rigel can compete with this, remember this star is so bright on your sky because it's essentially, its radius is the size of our solar system, right? So its surface area is just preposterously huge. See how Rigel competes with Betelgeuse. This 
this star is of a comparable luminosity. And this would be a uh, an example of a blue supergiant, I believe. I don't I don't think it's in this main sequence stage. So the luminosity is staying constant. Sorry, what's happening to the radius? There's the real question. Um, it increases. Yeah. Walk walk us through that, Vladimir. Why does the radius increase, or how do you know the radius increases? So I know that the radius increases diagonally to the right. Yeah. But uh, that's not the reason, because if the temperature drops, but the luminosity doesn't really change, then the ra radius has to increase. You said the very two things I wanted to say. You could know the radius increases by one of two ways. One way is the physics way. Temperature is going down, but the star still pumps out the same amount of light. It must be getting bigger. The other thing which can trick people up sometimes is if radius increases diagonally up and to the right, even a star that slides horizontal will actually end up with a bigger radius because lines of constant radii, you'll notice on the HR diagrams that you have, let me use purple for lines of constant radii. They kind of go like this, right? I'm not doing a very good job of this, but these are lines of constant radii. So as the star drifts, horizontally, it's moving up towards the right diagonal edge. Okay, and you, you understood both aspects, Vladimir, which is all I wanted to, to convey. So now we can do the fun part, which is clear all drawings. I wanna look at the different types of nuclear fusion these high mass stars undergo. And I gave you a little teaser of it last week. So this is what we might call, unfortunately, this is red giant phase. And I don't know, I made these probably 10 years ago when I was drunk. So let's call these blue super giants. Okay. <laughs> Not like today. All right. Anyways. Uh, all right. So F598. Uh, <clears throat> why the weed smoking illustrator that they hired for this project made the star red? I don't know. That's an unfortunate choice. That's what happens when you get some cut rate art students to do your diagrams for you. <laughs> okay. This star clearly should have a blue outer envelope, um, but we'll, we'll forgive them. And you'll notice here that red giants, I'm sorry, blue supergiants, they obviously, during their main sequence phase, they do hydrogen to helium fusion using the CNO cycle. We already know that. We know they have to do helium to carbon fusion by the triple alpha process. If you were to ask me, are there fancy names for the other types of fusion? I would say not exactly because things just start to get a little more chaotic fusion wise. The, the reactions are not, for instance, what really happens when carbon starts undergoing oxygen fusion, leftover helium nuclei just start to smash into all the other particles. And, and we call these reactions helium capture reactions. Let's look at some examples. Helium, an alpha particle slams into a carbon, boom, creates an oxygen atom. An oxygen nucleus gets whacked by another alpha particle, boom, creating neon. Neon gets whacked with a helium nucleus, creating magnesium. At some point, you start to run out of helium nuclei, and then the big boys start to smash into each other. Now, there are names in more advanced classes called R processes and S processes. Your book just kind of lamely calls them other reactions because they don't want to break your spirit bank. But basically, let's just look at the pictures of what's happening. Giant nuclei are now smashing into each other to make even more giant nuclei. Carbon and oxygen slam together to create silicon. There's your beach sand right there. The surfaces of all the terrestrial planets are made of silica. Oxygen slam together to make sulfur. Silicons then slam to make iron. And once you slam two silicons into an iron nucleus, let's look at that bad boy, 26 protons and 30 neutrons. Notice that you needed four extra neutrons just to glue this, glue this nucleus together via the strong force. 26 protons, that's like 26 drunk, angry men in a room. They're gonna be fighting each other, okay? They hate each other, they're positive, they want to repel according to the electrostatic repulsion. The strong nuclear force is having a hard time just gluing this beast together. And as you remember, iron occupies a special place in nuclear physics, what a Chad. It's called, uh, it's called a magic nucleus. And as I uh, attempted to demonstrate, or at least talk to you about before, that after, after you get to iron, 
this unfortunately is inverted from the picture I showed you before, but you keep releasing energy as you fuse hydrogen into helium, helium into carbon and carbon into oxygen. After iron, the only way, and you can fuse iron into heavier elements, otherwise there wouldn't be materials like gold, lead, uranium, and protactinium in nature. But the only way to do it is to, is to have to put gamma rays in, you have to add energy to an iron nucleus to make it fuse. So if iron starts to fuse, that's gonna suck gamma rays and energy out of the core of the star, and that's gonna lead to a runaway collapse. I wanna show you guys something else fun. Um, do you guys remember how long high mass stars like an O-type star will live on the main sequence? What's the typical lifespan of, of hydrogen to helium fusion for a high mass star? You of course know the length of, of time for the sun, right? How long does the sun undergo hydrogen fusion for? Um, 10 billion years. Good. Anyone remember what the lifespan is for a, the, the hydrogen lifespan for a high mass star? We can cheat. 10 million years. Ah, pretty good, yeah. You can see 10 to the power of seven is the same as 10 times 10 to the six, right? This is for students who still never figured out the scientific notation thing. 10 to the seven is 10 times 10 to the six. That's 10 million years. Pretty much every time you undergo a new type of fusion, it cuts the lifespan of the star down by a factor of 100. So first of all, let's add some nuclear fusion uh, cycles in here, right? We have what are called helium capture reactions. And I'm going to call, I don't like other reactions. I'm going to call it heavy nuclei fusion, OK? And we can list a few of the key elements produced just by, uh, where was that slide, 61 or so? No, 90, it was 90, 91. OK, I don't know what I'm doing. I can't remember my slides. One hundred. So we'll we'll use this slide over here. So we do. We've already done helium to carbon. So we have carbon to oxygen. Oxygen to neon. And then we can do magnesium, Mg. Uh, I guess they skipped sulfur here, silicon, iron. And this is this is the the element that I really want you to remember. The the symbol on the periodic table for iron. Sorry, you guys can't see what I'm doing. I apologize. Um, the symbol for iron on the periodic table is Fe. So I put that in parentheses. That's for students who haven't had chemistry. Just as carbon is the end state for a low mass star, iron is the end state of nuclear fusion for a high mass star. So I kind of just took a few notes there. I put the final element fused for each type of star in a box to try to help us pick it out with our eyeballs, OK? All right. I want to play a game with you guys. Man, I'm moving slow today. Vladimir told us that hydrogen to helium fusion takes 10, 10 billion years, right? And I'm telling you that each new cycle, each new fusion cycle cuts the lifespan of a star down by a factor of 100. So roughly how long should it take to undergo helium to carbon fusion? For our sun? For a giant 30 solar mass star. 
You're talking about high mass stars. Okay. So, oh, oh, I think it's thousand years. I'm sorry. Hundred thousand years. Right. Ten to the power of seven divided by a hundred. Ten to the power of two is ten to the power of five years. And ten to the power of five years is a hundred thousand. Um, let's do this on the board because my I just don't have the right skills with this mouse here. Okay, I just need uh, I hate to destroy. Okay, you know what? We're gonna play that game in a moment. Let's fill out our chart. Let's complete the chart, and then we can move on note wise. That makes sense from your point of view. It's gonna turn out that when high mass stars die, they don't make a little cute smoke ring that we call a planetary nebula. They have a very violent explosion, and that's gonna be fun to talk about. It's a supernova. A supernova is the is the dramatic high stakes explosion of a high mass star when it dies. The type of supernova that we have to identify is called a type two supernova. And I'll get into that later on, type one versus type two supernovae. Unlike a low or intermediate mass star, the central core of the star has one of two possible fates. One fate is that the core of the star crushes down into a lump of neutrons called a neutron star. The other possibility is that the leftover remnant collapses on itself forever and forms a black hole. So all high mass stars will do a supernova, but it's either a neutron star or a black hole. I think I got some dry erase marker in my mouth. It tastes very bad. I just want you guys to know that the dry erase marker doesn't taste good. All right. <clears throat> okay. I kind of want my board back, but I think this is such a lovely chart Pepper spray, <laughs> yeah, okay. Maybe I'll try that next. Now listen, this is a lovely chart because this synthesizes a lot of the stuff that I would like to teach you about stars into one easy to memorize chart here, okay? So keep keep this around, especially if you're plan planning on taking the final exam. <clears throat> um. <clears throat> Andrew, how are you doing there? I want to erase this at some point. I'm all set. All right. I'm going to erase this unless anyone objects, okay? I'm glad that was a goal. A goal for today was to finish that chart. And I, it took me a little longer than I anticipated, but I did it. Okay, let's just play around with life cycles for a second, okay? Let's take notes on the lifespan of a blue supergiant, just for fun, okay? So during the main sequence phase, it's undergoing hydrogen to helium fusion, and that takes uh, a time scale of about 10 to the seven years, which is 10 million years. Um, during the first stage, I called it the red giant stage, but it's really the the first stage of its uh, blue supergiant lifespan, it's going to go helium to carbon fusion. And that's going to happen by the triple alpha process. And each time we're going to divide the life cycle by a factor of 100. 10 to the 7 minus 2 is 10 to the power of 5, or 100,000 years. If we then move on from carbon to oxygen fusion, how long should that take? Um, thousand years. Oh, wait. Yeah, it is. Yeah. If you divide by two. It's so small. I feel like you're doing this and then explaining why it's not happening. No, no, no. This is the, this is, this is the God's honest truth, okay? 
So now we're going to go from oxygen to neon. Wait, we can't see your board. Sorry. Okay, how long should it take a blue supergiant to undergo all of its oxygen fusion? Um, measly 10 years. Yeah, measly 10 years. How about to undergo its neon to magnesium fusion? Oh, so 10, 0, 0, 0 0.1 year? 0 0.1 year, but come on, we're better than this. Uh, if you divide that by a hundredth, you get a tenth of a year. What's a tenth of a year in days? 36 and a half days. Yeah. Damn. Okay. How about magnesium to silicon fusion? Further? Wow. So 0 0.365 days. So how many hours would that be? 24, 8.76 hours. <laughs> All right. So roughly nine hours, approximately. And then how about silicon to iron? Um, divided by 100 times minutes. Um, 5.3 minutes. Yeah. Um, the more advanced graduate textbooks that do much more sophisticated calculations, they get 15 minutes. But a time scale of about... The factor of 100 is, uh, yeah, it is kind of an, an approximate. <laughs> This is, yeah, this is weak sauce, okay, but whatever. <laughs> weak but sauce. Still, hey, guess what? I still got the right answer, Vladimir. Okay. <clears throat> Do you understand my point? What's my point here? I don't I mean, I don't even know if I have a point. I think my point like, is that's effed up, right? Yeah. <laughs> like the star keeps squeezing smaller and smaller amounts of lifespan out of increasingly more complex types of fusion. In fact, the hydrogen to helium and the helium to carbon fusion, they support the majority of the star's lifetime. The rest of this stuff happens in a blink of an eye. In fact, Vladimir, thinking about these timescales kind of makes me think about humans. How does a, how does a, red, how does a high mass star compare to a low mass star Let's, let's check something out here. There's a time scale for stars to form, and there's a time scale for stars to undergo hydrogen fusion. And I think somewhere in the slideshow, I have a little note on the rough, the rough time periods for protostar formation. So before a star enters the main sequence, before it begins its lifespan as a ball with fusion, it has to undergo this protostar collapse that we talked about some time. It looks like it takes our sun about 50 million years to form. It looks like it takes a high mass star about 60,000 years to form. High mass stars just do everything faster because there's more gravity, there's more crunch, there's more squeeze, there's more fusion, all right? So let's compare 60,000 years to 5 million years, okay? So if we have an O star, An O star to form takes 60,000 years. And then for its lifespan, it's approximately 10 to the seven years. So what percentage of its lifespan does it spend uh, as a baby star, as a protostar? Let's divide them up. Where's my calcy here? Or you guys could divide them up. That's kind of your job, right? You're my, you're my computers, as Pickering would say. So we'll do 60,000 divided by 1 exp7. And I get 6 times 10 to the minus 3. Or a high mass star sends, is like a half a percent of its life is spent forming. For a, um, for a G-type star, like our sun, 
to form. Uh, what was the number again? Was it 50 million years? Yeah, 50 million years. And its lifespan is 10 billion years. So play the same game with, game with me, guys. What percentage of its life does it spend as a protostar? Um, 5%? No, really? No? No, not, not 5%, Vladimir. That's point, that's 5 times 10 to the minus 2. I get 5 times 10 to the minus, wait, did I get the same percentage? Holy shit. It's actually quite similar. It's 0.5% Vladimir, right? Or did I do something wrong? No, I think I did. Oh, yeah, I did. Okay, good. You were scaring me then. Is there symmetry in nature? How would this compare to a human? How long does a human spend forming? How long? Nine, yeah. nine months. Which is uh, what? Uh, three fourths of a year? So 0.75 years. And let's say a human lives to 100 years, which is hopeful. But so if you do 0.75 years over 100 years, what do you get? You get 0 0.008 or 0.8%. Do you guys see what my point is? Do I have a point? I'm not even sure if I have a point. I'm just kind of goofing around with you here. I mean, 100 years for an average lifespan is uh, kind of crude, not going to lie. But uh, whatever. <laughs> they're if, around. If you plug 70 in there, you're going to get almost the same answer, right? You're not thinking like an astronomer. An astronomer thinks in powers of 10, not in 8 versus 7, you know? Hey, man, let's uh, and split some so they're, waffles. They're with oh, wait a minute. You only you spent $8.75. You got that extra cup of coffee. How about we just split the bill down the middle? You know what I'm saying? Okay, so... If you if you do 0.75 divided by 70, uh, okay. What's my point? They are within the same. Uh, They're uh, comparable. Yeah. The time it's there's a kind of it's funny how the time it takes a human to gestate is comparable in percentage to the time it takes a star to gestate. In a way, stars are kind of like humans. They go through a proto-human phase. They are born, they live out their lives. And then when they turn into blue supergiants, they become old grouchy stars and they go through successively more bullshit and then eventually they explode, okay? So <laughs> <laughs> really diverse from the stars. Imagine if humans died this way, that would be, I, I'd like to die like that. <laughs> Just my heart, you know. Yeah, die hard. <laughs> what the hell? We'll see what we can do. We'll see what we can do, Vladimir. <laughs> um, <clears throat> if you make it to a hundred, um, I'll I'll feed you a nice cake made of nitroglycerin, and you can just go out with a bang, just like a just like a high mass star. Okay. <laughs> um. Once the star undergoes this rapid collapse, something wild starts to happen to my high mass star. So here's where we can have some fun. I've been kind of building up this with you guys. 15 minutes is a pitifully short, stupid amount of time for that last cycle of fusion. And let's remember that up to now, uh, I just want to find those heavy reactions here. What's been happening in slide 102 is that successively heavier nuclei are smashing together eventually to make iron. 
So inside the core of our high mass star, we have zillions upon zillions of iron nuclei all tightly pressed against each other. And even if they do try to smash together, they don't create energy, they suck energy out of the star. And that's a little bit unfortunate because the star is 30 times the mass of our sun and it's all pressing right down on that central degenerate nugget of hot iron. In fact, remember that not only are there iron nuclei floating around inside the star, but their electrons, which have been ripped off, the electrons are all kind of floating around as well. In fact, it is the electron degeneracy. Um, I, I want to clear this out. I want to try this again. So imagine you have an iron nucleus, right? And the iron nuclei are surrounded by all of these electrons. It's actually the electron degeneracy that prevents the star from collapse for a little bit. But as the weight of the star begins to press down on all of these electrons and iron nuclei, eventually the, the nuclei can't take it anymore. And the gravity smushes the damn electrons into the iron nuclei and collapses all of the iron nuclei into just millions upon trillions of neutrons. It basically collapses all of the iron nuclei if, remember, if you jam an electron into a proton, you can create a neutron. And this, according to the weak force, must be accompanied by the releases of zillions upon zillions of neutrinos. Neutrinos are these little ghost-like particles that have no charge. And normally, a neutrino can fly right out of the star without colliding with another atom. Forgive me if I told you this statistic before. But normally, to have a 100% chance of stopping a neutrino in its tracks, you need to have a slab of lead. And that slab of lead has to be one light year in thickness. A slab of lead, one light year in thickness, will have a 100% chance of having one collision with a neutrino and another nucleus. But let me tell you, if that slab of lead is only a half of light year thick, 50% of the time, the neutrino can pass through it without hitting another atom or nuclei. On the other hand, the, yeah, that's how, go, these are gossamer, uh, Enrico Fermi named them, and neutrino means little tiny one, okay? It's like little cute guy, okay? That's what it means. Um, <clears throat> neutrinos play a really important role in astronomy, and if I have time this week or next week, I'll tell you some cool stories about modern day neutrino science including today's foremost neutrino telescope known as Ice Cube, which is stationed in our Antarctica. There's a lot of cool stories to tell you here. Try to imagine that even though a neutrino can pass through a slab of lead half a light year thick, the interiors of high mass stars are so dense that the neutrinos actually do start making collisions with those neutrons and those iron nuclei. And, and they help kind of drive and blow this star apart in a very dramatic uh, explosion. The explosion is what we would call a detonation. This is the difference between a planetary nebula and a supernova. A supernova actually, you know like explosions from your favorite action movies? Those are, the, the detonation is a shock wave. And I've got a couple of pictures to show you how this works. What is an explosion? What makes that kaboom that you see in your favorite video game or, or, or sci-fi movie? It's when you have it's a gas. Oh, Vladimir, do you want to weigh in on this? Uh, well, it's like mm, it's like a fire, but an extremely compressed time scale, and sort of basically. So let's look at gas, and let's make some gas particles. This could be the air inside this room. There is a speed of sound sound waves propagate through air based on the temperature and the density, just a couple of, not too many factors. I think the speed of sound in air is around uh, 300 meters per second or something like that. So when I talk to you, even through this crappy little webcam microphone, my voice is oscillating sound waves that travel 300 meters per second and they travel from your speakers to your air at 300 meters per second. But it is possible in some situations when you perform violence to push gas particles faster than the speed that they naturally want to travel at. And what happens then is you kind of create a snowplow that we call a shock wave. 
you create a super, super thin, super heated layer of high density gas. And this high density gas blasts forward through the other gas, picking up particles as it goes because it's traveling faster than the gas particles would like. And let's look at some examples that you may have encountered from nature. So um, <clears throat> I think I put a couple in my slideshow here. The report of a bullet when, when, a, when you fire a, a pistol, that creates a shock wave. Sorry, I think I might've put them here in my stellar death lecture. I can also quickly grab them off the internet. So let's, let's see here. Okay, so here's, here's a couple of slides that I thought might help you guys visualize it. So this is, sound is a compressional wave. When I speak to you, when I oscillate air molecules, my vocal cords are vibrating the air, creating a compression, and then you space out and have a rarefication. And these compressions of air travel at 300 meters per second. Um, when you fire a bullet faster than the speed of sound, you hear the crack, the report of a bullet. And here's, I think, maybe an infrared image of the bullet traveling through air. You'll notice there's some turbulent gas behind the wake of the bullet. But here, if you guys see this here, this is what is known as the bow shock. The bow shock is a super heated, high compression wave. This is the, this is the, the crack that you hear. When this hits your ears, it's very painful and unpleasant. And it travels in the wake, the bow shock is, it's kind of like an explosion. Um, other places where you can hear an explosion, uh, obviously a supersonic jet, a jet that goes faster than the speed of sound. Here you can see the, the supersonic jet creating the bow shock behind it. That super compressed layer of high density gas causes condensation. You can basically see the water in the air just uh, condensing right into a cloud. And if you've ever gone to an air show and seen one of these supersonic jets, you know there's a, a supersonic boom that hits your ears afterwards. When Indiana Jones cracks his bullwhip, that is breaking this. That's that's the sound. In fact, you can even break the sound barrier right here with a ruler. Um, and uh, well, how do I want to do this? I can't really. Hold on, guys. I'm trying to figure out how I want to position this. Let's point it at the floor. Okay, hopefully I won't knock the camera over. And when you take a ruler and you snap it, okay. Uh, wait, I just want to make sure it's in the field of the camera. If you take the ruler and you go, that, that snap actually exceeds the speed of sound. And that's that creates a little shock wave itself. My point is that when a, when a high mass star explodes, it's a bona fide explosion. It pushes the gas faster than the speed of sound. Uh, another way that they sometimes uh, explain the physics is with something called a neutron star bounce. And you guys can try this at home sometime. If you have like a little ping pong ball and a basketball, oh geez, I don't know if I can do this demo or not. First of all, let me see if it works. If you've ever played this game where you take like a basketball, something bouncy, and then you put a smaller ball on top of it, like a little bouncy ball or a ping pong ball. When you drop them, you can actually get this little particle to fly super high into the air, like sometimes up to like 20 or 30 feet. And it's a question of momentum. What happens is the two balls fall at the same time. The first ball collides and recoils and bounces back and gives a kick to the second ball. Since this one is more massive, it usually provides several times the momentum and flies it way up to the air. Just a fun little trick you can play in this in your backyard or in the schoolyard. I love doing this demo in class because it sends things flying around the room, but I, I'm realizing that there's kind of no awesome way to do it here because my camera has such a narrow field of view. So I won't I won't try. <clears throat> but but try that yourself. If you can find a basketball and a little bouncy ball, go out and and drop the two together and watch the thing pop off into the air. That's also similar to what's happening in a neutron star, because remember, when you create a neutron star, when you smoosh that core down into a ball of neutrons, that thing has an incredible mass and an incredible density, and the gas just basically recoils off the star. Now, 
we do have a couple of moments where we've seen a neutron star or a, a, a high mass star supernova go off. First of all, I want to show you the stuff that we find left behind. Probably one of the best examples of a supernova remnant, and keep in mind, this is millions of years after the supernova goes off now. Unlike that nice, neat planetary nebula that you saw before, like the Ring Nebula, which is a perfect donut of gas, you can literally see the violence and the explosion in a supernova remnant. This, of course, is the famous Crab Nebula, a legendary supernova remnant. Believe it or not, there's a little neutron star that's buried inside there. And you can just see how the gas has shredded itself to bits. So some of these supernova remnants, you can see the violence. Now, there was a legendary type two supernova that went off in 1987. In 1987, and let me just show you some of the fun pictures here. Have I ever talked to you guys about the uh, Large Magellanic Cloud? <clears throat> the Large Magellanic Cloud is a small galaxy that orbits the Milky Way. It can only be seen from the Southern Hemisphere. So you've probably never seen it unless you grew up in Argentina. And this is a picture <clears throat> just prior to 1987's uh, dramatic supernova. Keep in mind, this isn't even in our galaxy. This is in a next door neighbor galaxy. And it's kind of an irregular galaxy that has like a bunch of star forming regions. That's probably the combined light of maybe a billion stars all just overexposing the photograph. This star was an ordinary star that no one had ever given a shit about until 1987, where one day this star underwent a type two supernova. And let's look at the before and after picture. So there is the brilliant light from this thing before and after. Now, I want you guys to just think about luminosity or brightness. For, think about brightness for a second. This is the combined light of probably close to 10 to the nine uh, solar luminosities, okay? Something like that. And this one star, when it explodes, has, has a brightness that rivals the central billion stars in the, in the center of this irregular galaxy. So these supernova are insanely luminous. This was, uh, by the way, how far away is the Large Magellanic Cloud? Uh, 50,000 light years. One of my professors told me, because he was uh, you know, a graduate student at the time, you actually could, if you went to the Southern Hemisphere, you could see this with your naked eye. You could actually see this for a few days as a small star in the sky. Could you imagine? If Betelgeuse did this, we've, we, we did that calculation in our last week's class, right? We found it would be what, 60,000 or 80,000 times more uh, brighter than Sirius in our nighttime sky. So we've only been doing astronomy smart for a couple of thousand years. That's a very short time scale in the life of stars. One day, humans are going to get to see this, and it's going to be pretty wild. I don't know if Betelgeuse will be the culprit or whatever. We actually do observe supernovae all the time, but we often get to observe them in other galaxies. Um, and they're actually an important tool that astronomers use to measure distances. The neutron stars themselves are pretty weird. What's, how am I doing on time here? I don't wanna bust my budget. All right, I'm getting close to the edge. So today, what I was supposed to do I kind of knew this was going to happen. I knew we needed some time to just think about the evolution of a high mass star in comparison to a low mass star. And I think we did that. Next class, because white dwarfs, because neutron stars and black holes are so bizarre in terms of their physics, they require their own moments of discussion. And that's what we're gonna do on Thursday. That's what we're gonna do um, that's what we're gonna do with our final week. We'll kind of finish up black holes and then we'll have a little bit of time for a f sort of free for all. We can talk about stuff that you guys wanna talk about. We could talk about general relativity. I would like to show you guys pictures of galaxies and just kind of talk about it. I imagine our final class that lasts, not this Thursday, but a week from Thursday as a kind of victory lap where we look at cool pictures of space, talk about stuff that's wild and awesome. I have lectures and little tidbits to tell you about other cool parts of astronomy that like cosmology, the big bang, there's like a million different things we could talk about. 
basically, I just want to have fun. That's what I want to do. I just want to have fun with this class, all right? And it's nice knowing we don't have the pressure of the final, but what we do have the pressure to do is to do one more lab. So we'll have done 12 labs. We'll do that next week. And we're going to do two more homeworks, one homework on Thursday, one homework next Thursday. Now, I'm not so worried about Andrew, Mateus, and Vladimir, because you guys are usually hanging with me each class. So I know that you'll do the homework and immediately submit it. But I would like to say to any students who kind of watch the videos at home later, trolls in the background, if you're one of those people that sort of got behind on assignments, I tried to work with you all semester and allow people to turn in some of their work late for full credit. But once the class kind of comes to a halt, there's going to be no more time for that. So I really want to emphasize that we, we plan ahead and we get that work done on time. Does, does that make sense? I kind of really don't need to say this to you guys, but I need to say it to whoever might be high people at home. I hope you actually watch these videos. You probably don't. <laughs> all, right. Um, all right. So that's our plan. So next, next class, Tegan the troll understands. Okay, that's what I want to hear. <laughs> um, okay, so we have a plan and we know how the rest of this class is going to work. Does this sound good? I hope you guys don't object to, to me canceling lab today, but I think 12 homeworks and 12 labs is a nice symmetrical number. We'll tie it up nice like that, okay? It's a beautiful day. Uh, go out and enjoy the sun, and I'll see you guys on Thursday, okay? Vladimir, I'll be in touch once I'm done with that proposal. Sounds good. All right, guys. Over and out. See you Thursday.